stand up. I have too much energy to sit down. So I, I want to stand up. It's open for a mic. I know, but my focus is not on the media, it's for the students. So you're going to have to deal with all. to uh, University of Belgrade. I jokingly said to them a little bit earlier, I wish uh, you would get me to come here for a whole semester so that I could spend the semester kind of teaching about uh, the university, uh, the university students, the relationship between America and the Balkans, and specifically Serbia. I usually, when I get up to speak, the first thing I say after the introduction is, you forgot my favorite title. Because when I'm in the U.S. and they introduce me, they usually just brush through and they say, oh, he's the former acting director of national intelligence and the former ambassador to Germany. And I get up and say, wait a minute, my favorite job was being the presidential envoy for Kosovo-Serbia negotiations. And it's really true. For me, it was an honor of a lifetime. We have so many Serbian-Americans, Albanian-Americans who care very deeply about this region, and they've taught many of us in America the importance of this region. I don't have to tell you all the importance, but many Americans need to learn it. I have with me uh, several of my colleagues from a private equity firm who are here in the region looking at ways in which we can bring American investments to this region. I feel like that's kind of my role. I'm currently in the private sector after serving in government, and now I want to implement all of the things that I talked about in government. I think too many times we have government officials who talk about idealism, but we don't really have a lot of follow through on implementing those ideas. And what we've learned in life is that what works on a piece of paper, in theory, doesn't always work in the real world. And that's one thing that President Trump taught me about this process and what President Trump asked me to do. You know, we've talked about the political solutions in the Balkans for 25 years. I think it was time to take the process away from just the politicians who, let's be honest, benefit many times from having a conflict. <laughs> They can beat their chest and pretend like they have solutions. And so President Trump was an outsider, a complete outsider. The first time that he stayed overnight in Washington, D.C. was the week that he was there to be inaugurated President of the United States. He wasn't a creature of Washington, D.C., which is why in many ways people in that system attack him, continue to attack him, because he is the total outsider. What President Trump asked me to do during this dialogue was to say, you know, let's scrap all these political people and trying to figure out how do you come up with words to recognize each other and do it on paper. He said, what well, young people really need are jobs. You have too many young people that were leaving this region to go to Germany or Hungary or Poland. And what President Trump thought was, let's give people the ability to stay in their country of origin, build a family, and grow. And to do that, you got to have good paying jobs. And that's what the politicians, I think, many times were forgetting about, were the economic development aspects of what was happening in the region. You're going to fight less if you have a nice paying job. You're probably going to have uh, less time to worry about all the political problems if you have a well-paying job. And so what we tried to do was to figure out how do we do that? How do we begin to have this economic normalization? I'll say this, the, um, the idea of the open Balkans, to me in theory sounds good, right? It sounds like we should have this system where the countries in the region all work together. It's an open system and there's economic trade. And so we came out and said, we're for this idea. We weren't for every single idea on paper. 
but we are for the idea in theory that you should work together and, and have borders that support economic normalization and trade. We want to be able to have a system where people can go freely throughout the region and goods can be traded throughout the region. That's only going to benefit all of you. On the political side, we really tried to emphasize that for 25 years, we are fighting about many of the same issues that politicians like to fight about. And we've got to move beyond that. So my hope was to convince the Europeans that that's what we needed to do. But as uh, an American, I can tell you that we get very frustrated with a European process that is a lot of talk and not a lot of action. And we've seen it in the Balkans. I've watched as European politicians come here and promise and say, oh, we're going to have another dialogue, we're going to meet in Brussels. And this is their industry. Politicians in Europe like to have an industry where NGOs come, there's white papers, we think about things, we talk about them. We don't really solve anything, because if you solve something, then you're going to actually get rid of their power and get rid of their jobs. And so I think that, that one of the lessons through this process, if you are frustrated with the EU process, and if you thought that the Americans, when we were in charge of the Balkans process for the world, did a better job of moving things forward, then you have a voice and you should speak up. You should talk about the importance of recognizing that economic development and all the agreements that we negotiated are a priority and that it shouldn't just be in the hands of some politicians from Brussels who want everybody to come together and just sit. I mean, I've been in thousands of these diplomatic meetings, and many of them are a total waste of time. You come in, and you sit, and you put the flags, and everybody's nice, and they exchange cards, and there's titles, and there's people talking about titles. And you leave, and you say to yourself, what did we just do? I met people, I traveled to another country, and yeah, it was fun, I stayed overnight in a new hotel, and I met all these new people, but it didn't help the situation. And that's where I think that if you are studying to help solve problems, if you want to be a diplomat, you have to be somebody who is willing to talk about issues when others don't want to talk about those issues. You can't just be part of the process to sit at a table and let the, the leaders, the politicians, decide what the issues are. You have to think about the end user. We talk about the end user a lot in America. And the end user is you. If we're going to solve political problems through diplomacy, the reason you solve those are to make the lives of people better. And so I had to ask myself in this process, is having another meeting in Brussels to talk about recognition and derecognition and all that going to actually help people in the region? I couldn't say yes to that. I think that the solution is, if I want to be a good diplomat, if I want to move the situation to a, a better solution, then I have to think about what's best for you, and that means jobs and the economy. And how do you develop uh, the, the region altogether? There's this idea in America called the perceived conflict in the Balkans. And it's a very real concept. If you ask a typical Westerner, whether it's somebody in Germany or somebody in America, about the Balkans, I think there's an immediate sense that there's a conflict. What I had to do was to remind those who work in the American government, those who work in the European government, that this is a perceived conflict. That the conflict is not what you think. It's one of the reasons why this is very controversial, but I believe it very uh, deeply. It's one of the reasons why I think that the Americans need to bring home the K-4 force in Kosovo. We shouldn't have forces in Kosovo after decades of the problem basically being over, this is a perceived conflict now. We don't need to have 
NATO troops or American troops under the NATO umbrella. We don't need them anymore. It only emphasizes to Fortune 500 companies, why should I go into that region where there's a conflict, where there happens to be NATO troops? It creates this perceived conflict, which is not good for the region and not good for economic development. If you want to convince Westerners to invest in this region and create new industries and new high-paying jobs, you have to get rid of the perceived conflict. You cannot just be fighting constantly from a, a debate point of view. You have to be able to say what's best for us in the future is developing these industries. So I would also challenge you to concentrate on getting rid of that perceived conflict because it's very real and it stops many Americans and West American companies and Western companies from coming here and investing. So I'd like to take some questions about uh, the situation. And I, I love tough questions, so feel free to um, ask me anything that you want. But I want to finish up with one more point about uh, the current situation. I think it's really important, I touched on this, of your voice in this process. I would encourage you to uh, stand up to what you see as a lack of progress. If you don't like something that's happening, you have to raise your voice. You have to use your pen and write, uh, write opinion pieces and, and protest or uh, speak out on social media or do interviews with the media. But don't just grumble about the situation privately. You have to be able to articulate what frustrates you, because you will be very surprised when you begin to articulate what you don't like about a public policy or a situation. There are a whole bunch of people that agree with you, but they're afraid to speak up as well. And so I would encourage you in today's world to take to social media, but raise your voice on issues that you're frustrated with, and do it in a nice way. Do it in a direct way. Be honest but also be transparent about the situation. Because your voice is really important for not only Europeans to hear, but for Americans to hear. We want to hear from this region as to what the solutions are. We don't want to just have a conversation about recognition and derecognition. We want to have a conversation about your economic livelihood and what's best. There are American companies and European companies who could make money here and bring jobs here and you all can have a better standard of life, of living. And that's what we're trying to do, that's what I'm trying to do from the private sector, is to let people know that this is a region full of great ideas, hungry people to, uh, and I mean hungry in making, trying to make their lives better, wanting to improve the situation, and that we should engage more in the Balkans. That's my hope, and that's the work that I'm doing from the private sector now. So with that, I'd love to uh, take questions. I encourage you to ask me tough questions. You don't have to be nice if you don't want to. Uh, but I would encourage you to uh, share what's on your heart, share what's on your mind, and ask some tough questions.